if I just helped one person, if there was just one person, I had a phone call, a conversation, a breakthrough, some mentoring, some coaching. I learned maybe I'm the person that got help that day. But if one person got better, the day was a success. Welcome to the More Than Corporate Podcast. I'm Amber Furman, recovering perfectionist and serial accomplisher. If you're anything like I used to be, you've been living your life thinking that if you accomplish enough stuff, you'll finally find the success you've always wanted. But what if it's not about accomplishing more stuff? What if it's about accomplishing the right stuff? I believe you don't find success. You create it by intentionally designing the life you want and having the courage to get out of your comfort zone to live your design. I went from doing what I was supposed to do to doing what I love to do, and now I get to help others do the same. Keep listening as I chat with inspiring people who make it their mission to live their best life every day and learn how you too can live the life you've always wanted. Welcome back to another episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. Dustin Bogle is my guest today, and Dustin has become a great friend of mine. Not only do I pay him to kick my ass nutritionally and make some workouts and hold me accountable and, and be that person that is going to help me meet my fitness goals, but he's just an amazing guy that really cares about seeing other people succeed. Dustin has this unique background. He was an overweight teenager and high school, who was extremely introverted and had zero confidence. He was introduced to strength training by a friend and immediately was hooked by how good it made him feel. He's lost 60 pounds and it gave him the confidence to train and perform as a professional wrestler. After 10 years, he exited his wrestling career and opened three gyms in Southern California while remotely coaching entrepreneurs and high achievers to get strong and healthy so they can show up as their best in all areas of their life. You know, I love that showing up the best you can in all areas of your life. And I'm super excited to dig into this conversation with Dustin before we bring him in really quickly. This show is brought to you by Success Development Solutions. If you are looking for a way to create the success that you want in your life, if you're wondering why you haven't reached that next level, if you're wondering why everybody else seems to have it together and you're feeling lost, let's jump on a call and let's find out what it is that's standing in your way and how we can get you out of it. There's a Calendly link that's going to be in the show notes of this. Let's get you going towards the definition of success that works for you so that you can start to create your environment instead of consume it and design the life you've always wanted. With that being said, let's go ahead and bring Dustin into the show. Justin, what's up, man? How are you? Amber, hello. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have you here. And I know that, you know, we met through the amazing Arate group um, and then had an opportunity to connect. And then I was looking for a nutritionist and then there you were. And it's been an amazing friendship that's grown from that. So thanks for taking the time to come on the show. Absolutely. I'm excited to talk to your audience and help them in any way I can. Yeah, I'm excited for that. Okay, so let's learn a little bit about who you are. Um, let's go back to like little little Dustin. What was it like for you growing up? Where were you born? So I'm from Southern California, and um, I would say from cities that are not known for wealth, like poverty-stricken cities. So um uh, people who live there will know them, but it's El Monte is where I was born. And then uh, most of my childhood was in Rialto. And I'm talking uh, neighborhood <laughs> uh, gangs, um, you know, fist fights, drugs, uh, people just doing shady things. So I kind of grew up learning the street smarts and, uh, you know, basically just growing up in that environment, you, you got to just learn to be resourceful, be smart. Um, learn how to talk to people, how to talk your way out of situations, uh, read body language because you can see who's a troublemaker and who doesn't look like there's someone you want to walk by and you might want to get on the other side of the street when you're walking home from school. So that's that's the neighborhood, you know, you call it from the from the, the school of hard knocks, the streets, baby. <laughs> <laughs> the school of hard knocks. Um, I feel like growing up in Southern Idaho, I had none of the school of hard knocks. Um, definitely like the only thing we were afraid of was like cows. So, um, 
So you grew up in Southern California. You had this school of hard knocks. You had this intuition. How did that serve you as you started to grow? I feel like so many times when we're going through our life as business owners, as entrepreneurs, um, that intuition and instinct and and gut feeling and judgment that you're talking about needing to have as a kid, um, we convince ourselves that we're being overly judgmental or that we shouldn't listen to that. Or So how did that serve you as you started to get older in your life when it came to business? Yeah, that's a good question. I think the first thing is um, I actually resorted to hiding from the world because my my parents, my my everything that I saw was danger. You know, if you just see gangs and um you know drug deals and guns and um weapons you just start to say well i guess i should stay home because that's where things are safe i shouldn't open myself up for relationships because i don't know what i'm going to get into and so that's where the the weight gain began was that i stayed inside and i just came glued to my tv i watched tv that was an escape you know to see these fun stories and adventures and movies and then I started playing, you know, a lot of video games, you know, being a gamer is what, you know, it's called today. It's kind of got a cool title, but, um, but basically just, you know, again, escaping. And, and it was through food and through entertainment that I just tuned out what was around me. I could escape through this tube in front of me. Now where it served me was that now I can learn to connect with people of different backgrounds. Like I never saw race. I never, like Ooh. I had black friends, I had Hispanic friends, I had white friends, I had, because it was like a, a, a mingle, my neighborhood. I never saw that, I never judged somebody based on that. But you know, when I grew up, I started to hear that people would see someone and judge. And I was like, man, I never had that, but that became a superpower that I can just go and connect with anybody because I had to relate with with the with the the black gangs in the neighborhood and then the hispanic gangs and then and then the white you know i mean we had nazi guys driving up and down our street you know waving their flags so i had to wow. become friends with everybody so it's like almost surviving prison without being in prison but that allowed me to connect with people and have good communication skills and to find what are the pains in your life and then like how can i help you right and so that that's where it showed up as a coach was being able to relate with somebody. And that's why, again, um, I guess that's that's what I look for is like, what is the pain that someone's going through? And then how can I relate to that pain? Because I've probably seen it show up at some point in my life in some way. That's really interesting. And, you know, you don't really think about that often about the unintentional biases that exist because of the groups of people that were raised around. And when you're constantly just dropped in this hodgepodge of all different types of people, both good and and not so great on the spectrum, um, it allows you to look past imperfections and faults and see that person. And, and I think that's a really interesting comment. Um, you had mentioned video games and I wanted to comment on something that I saw on your posts um, this last weekend that you had instituted for your family, like a no screen Sunday. Um, and I thought that that was really cool. So you grow up, you grew up with video games and now we have kids that are not just growing up with video games, they're living on video games. And so you had instituted this no screen Sunday and it had like this impact on your life. Can you talk about what was the driving force behind that and what effect you saw for your family? Yeah. I mean, earlier I was talking about pain and it probably brought back the pain of me attributing that sitting down in front of a screen all day is going to lead to weight gain. And I'm just like, holy cow, I'm raising my son to follow my footsteps unless I'm a good father, good leader. And I interject. And the difference was Amber, when I was young, gaming was wired, which means I had to walk away from it. Like the remote was wired to the Nintendo and I could not take it with me. Now it's wireless. I can have a phone. It's like I could take my Nintendo and I could walk down the street and it could be in front of my TV. I probably would have been crazy addicted if I had it the way it is now back then. So um, so basically, you know, again, I, I implemented that because I didn't want to see these things, uh, these, these life difficulties that I encountered happening to my son, my daughter. And also, I just know that, um, you know, they're 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 just being uh, completely distracted and, and um, you know, entertained all day, which is not a good way to kind of grow up that you think I wake up and be entertained, go to sleep, right? It, I have to work. I have to yeah. contribute, I have to create skills. I got to learn new skills. 
So now it's redirecting that. So I'm like, okay, what are we doing Sunday? Um, let's let's get a, a, um, a coach to come and teach us how to like walk our dogs because they're really bad at pulling our leash and like hurting our back. Let's get a drumming coach to come teach us how to play an instrument. Let's get a swimming coach and let's go, um, you know, learn different swim styles. But like, it's meant for learning. It's meant for a lot more outdoor activity. And it's also meant for a family bonding time. And so, you know, um, I'm busy. Everybody says, you know, everybody is, nobody would say they're not busy, but um, a planned day, it just, we're all in agreement. And so it's like, I'm putting my phone in my, in my uh, shelf and we're just forgetting about screens for the day. And so that makes you start asking questions. What could we do that screen list? Where throughout the day, you're like, hey, I just need to put a screen in front of them to get them to zip it so I can focus on work or whatever I need to do. So it just changes those questions. And so that's what I've learned over the years is like the quality of your life is, is linked to the quality of the questions you ask yourself. So, um, so that's where that comes from. I love it. So when you're, for you, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned your kids and not wanting them to go down the same path that you did and make the same mistakes that you did and end up with the same results as a teenager, as a business owner for you, where so many times we as entrepreneurs struggle with setting boundaries for ourselves. And you and I were actually just talking about this, you know, the need to prioritize self-care as much as you prioritize business. So as a business owner, what were the benefits that you saw for yourself in holding yourself to that same no screen time that you hold your kids to? Yeah, there's a, a quote that I love about leadership and, it, and it's about culture too. And it says the culture of an organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader will tolerate. All right. Ooh. And so, um, yeah, it's good. I'll say it again. If you guys want to write this down, the culture of an organization is shaped by the worst behavior the leader will tolerate. And so people will always test those boundaries and, and kids included. What can I get away with? If it's tolerated, I guess this is what they accept around here. And so do you allow tardiness? Do you now allow cursing? Do you allow sugar to be consumed all day? Do you allow people to speak badly to you? Whatever you tolerate, is the culture you're shaping for your life. And so if you want a better culture, a better group of, of people around you, you just got to raise the bar on the worst behavior you'll accept. All right. Because we'll all accept some level of bad behavior, but where's your line and everybody's is different. Right. So in terms of, you know, like how that translates to my business is yes, it, it goes to the team. Of course it goes to me. It goes to um, the clients that do business with us. Um, you know, every business has to take a stance. Do you allow somebody to come in and curse out your team and like throw a drink in their face, which I've witnessed at Starbucks. Um, and, and so like, that's kind of where it, it, it transitions is like the, and, and the culture of my household will be reflected in the culture of my business. Right. A lot of people try to separate the two, but it is your outer world is a reflection of your inner world. And so like, my home is what's going on in my head and and how I'm acting my family. That's going to translate. Don't they say to business? I love it here. They treat you like family. Well, what if your family life is not good? You don't want yeah. those clients to feel like family. Like you're like, <laughs> I don't talk to my family. We yell at home. Do you want to translate that to your business? So I actually say to people, this is not said enough. They go and work on their business first and then their home life second. I say, you know what? It'll probably work better if you flip it, make your home life better and it'll show up in your business. Right. Yeah, that's amazing. You're so growing up, these influences that you have now, did you get those from your parents? Were they in the entrepreneurial space or, or what did your parents do? No. So, so my dad was a truck driver and a, uh, 18 wheeler, you know, truck engine, uh, repairman and, you, you know, mechanic. And he worked on those things and loved it, but like never really talked about going out and doing his own thing. And my mom talked about it quite a bit, but just never pulled the trigger. Just that fear of like, what if it doesn't work? What if it fails? I remember her like having pamphlets out of like Subway franchising, uh, you know, paperwork and just reading it over. And just she looked at this and looked at that and talked about it, the family, but just didn't. And I've just always been one of those people like if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And so I was like, hey, I came to my clients one day that I was training in my garage and I even went to my mom and I was like, hey, I want to open a gym. And like no one even questioned it. They knew it was happening when I said it like that because that's how I've always been is that when I say I'm going to do something, I just do it. It's sad that a lot of people say they're going to do something and they don't. And I think that's one of the smallest things you can do 
to just change the trajectory of your life is just start doing what you say you're going to do, right? Just that's it. Follow through, show up. And so I said, Hey, I'm going to open a gym and um, you're going to get out of this garage and sweating in here and having no air conditioning and no heat. We're going to get into a controlled environment and you're actually going to save money. And um, I'm going to do this. And who wants to, you know, go there? And of course everyone said, yes, who wants to choose a garage over being in a, in a building? And then um, I went to my mom because I had about, about half the money and, you know, she's she's humming and hawing about a business, but she saw me like, oh, this is definitely going to happen. Uh, you know, it's Dustin. I know him. I know his track record. And so she she, you know, fronted the money for the other half of the business. And then, boom, I went all in on it. And then location one became two, became three. At one point, I had up to six locations. But then I realized this is not what I signed up for. Like, this is too much. Um, I, I, I kind of had a weak leadership team. I had weak stru structure and I didn't have systems. And so I sold one, I, I closed a couple and I got it to three and like, that's where I am now. And I feel like that's my sweet spot. Like I'm happier, it's my strongest locations. Um, the culture's good, the team's good. So that's where we are today. That's really interesting because you're talking about growing and then scaling yourself back and realizing that's not really where I want to be. That's not what I want to do. And in a culture where we're told grow, 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 it's really interesting to see somebody say, okay, I grew and that's not where I wanted to be. So I scaled back. What was that conversation like? Did you struggle with that at all? Yeah. I mean, that's a huge hit on my ego. And as a man, that's everything right to us is our ego and admitting failure but what I learned, Amber, is that some storms show up to make a mess in your life and some storms show up to clear a path. And that's what that storm was for me. And, you know, like even even pro wrestling, like, you know, like there was all so many cool things I learned from it. And people say, well, why'd you quit? You were you were good at it. You were on a good trajectory. And I, it just was not in alignment with who I was anymore. And so that's the same thing is like that ego of like. I want a hundred gyms. I used to say, I would, I was like, I'm taking over the country. I'm going to have a, a location in every city. As time went on, I, I just got real myself. And I said, is that what I really want? And I think that a lot of people don't stop and have that conversation with themselves. Like, is, you know, what do you want? And, you know, when people come to me, even as a coach, like I want to get healthy, I want to lose weight. That is such a fuzzy word and, and sentence to say, what, what is healthy to you? Is healthy to live just one more day? Is healthy to live to 100, 75? Like, oh, what is your body able to do? You know, like, what is what is your level of pain? Like, for some people, I live every day in a level pain 10 uh, or level 10 pain. So if it lives level seven would be great. Well, somebody level seven is hell on earth because every day they wake up and they're in level one, right? So like, what is your, what, what do you want? Get clear. And so as time went on and I experienced what it's like to operate six facilities, I was like, this is not what I want. And like, yes, that ego of like, man, to tell the clients we have to close doors or to tell the clients that's a wrap. But I, I just went to it with the truth. And I think, again, some people try to like flex or try to pretend that, it, you know, uh, it was some sort of strategy with their business. We just simply said, hey, this is not working. Um, and, and, you know, we're going to just close up shop. And here's some alternatives. Here's two or three other nearby gyms we trust or programs we trust. And it was a hard thing to do. And I probably pushed it off longer than I should have. But, you know, again, I think a lot of people wrestle with that, their egos. And, you know, uh, I'm one of them. And, and so that's uh, a lot of work that I do on myself and I wrestle with is like, is this is this helping people or is this serving your ego? And I think that's a good question, you know, for people to ask. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that drives so many different different things, you know, that, that nobody wants to look whatever comes after that, whether it, it's weak or whether it's disorganized or, you know, our, the way that we were raised has so much to do with what we think we have to look like to other people. And so I think that's really interesting. So you mentioned professional, professional wrestling. And I think this is really interesting because when um, we talk about your bio, you mentioned being overweight as a teenager. People don't normally associate overweight as a teenager with professional wrestling and athleticism. And then also this introvert, which I think is really interesting because I think introvert is something people get wrong so many times on, on what it is and how it really affects our life. So was it 
did going into professional wrestling have anything to do with the desire to get yourself out of that uncomfortable, unhappy place that you were as a teenager when you were overweight? Or how did that transition happen? Yeah, um, it's funny because I'm the same as you. I think the introvert gets mixed up. I think it's really just about knowing your energy. And so, like, um, I think the way that I kind of look at it from a, um, you know, like a, a an, another perspective is that an introvert wakes up with uh, a handful of coins and every time they have an interaction with another human, they're giving them a coin. And at the end of the day, their hands are empty and that the coins are their energy, right? Every interaction, I'm a little more drained. I'm a little more drained and I go home and my hands are empty. And I need to go to sleep. So when I wake up, I have a fresh batch of coins. The extrovert is the opposite. They wake up empty handed every interaction. They're taking a coin and they, at the end of the day, have a big handful of coins and they feel like a million bucks and they go to bed, they wake up and their hands are empty again. So I think it's about, you know, your energy. And I think intro introverts just know I need to turn it on. I'm doing it right now for this podcast, but then I need quiet time. I need to like, I, yeah. like a phone, I need to go plug myself in and allow myself to recharge so I can show up when the time is needed, the energy is needed. So yeah. I think it's just more of an intro, uh, energy discussion, right? Yeah, I think that's really interesting and super important for people to understand as well, because so many people don't want to be labeled as an introvert because they think, oh, like, I don't want to be, I don't want people to think I don't like people, right? Like, I love yeah. people. And that's really has nothing to do with it. It was really interesting. I just got back from a family vacation and we were talking about um, growing up and, and personalities and things to that effect. And my mom had made a comment about how I always loved to just be in my room. And I always considered myself an extrovert until I started going through this mindset training stuff, um, and NLP and, and really getting this figured out and realized I was an introvert. But then I'm listening to my mom talk and she's like, yeah, like I was always amazed because you were okay. Like you would just sit in your room and you would chill and you were good and you just wanted your alone time. And I'd go in and check on you and make sure you were okay. And you just, you just wanted to be there. And I had kind of forgotten about that. And at some point in time, we allow other people's expectations of how we should act and what we should need and how we should show up to impact our actions. And then we don't give ourselves that time and space that we need to recharge and we can't figure out why we're always exhausted. And so that was a really interesting conversation for me to have this weekend. And I thought it was interesting that you brought it up in your bio and then your description was perfect. Yeah. Thank you. And, and how that related to, to pro wrestling was, um, you know, basically I, because I was like glued to the TV and that was my escape. I thought that was my ticket out of, you know, the cities that I was living in. Like if I just become famous and I go, work for Vince McMahon, the WWE, all my problems will be solved. I'll have tons of friends, I'll have tons of money, I'll have a, tons of followers. And that that's just the, my solution to like, how I'm gonna get out of here. And and just like, it, also at that age, you know, everyone's asking me, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And it's like, yes. I think it's unfair because no one's asked you that for 18 years and then suddenly out of nowhere, right, right field, now you need to know what you're gonna do and have it cemented and be prepared to apply to a college. It's like, what? <laughs> like I'm just trying to survive PE class and like yeah. science and just like, and now I need to know my job and my vocation and my career. And I, I think at that age, people should just do a ton of experimenting with jobs. Like I, I worked at Wiener Schnitzel for a few months and then I was in contracting and construction. And then of course I was the weekend warrior doing pro wrestling. And then I did customer service and like, that tells you every time you do a job you don't like what you don't want and it moves you closer to what you do want. And then, you know, I also was starting to get into working out and I said, well, hey, I really enjoy this. I don't enjoy wiener since I don't like construction, but I like fitness. Why not try to find a way to make a living in this and get into that? And like everything I found that I didn't want, I got closer to what I do want. And then, you know, I started doing it and it didn't feel like work. I, f I loved it. And, and then like time passed by and you get in that flow state and so like, you know, back to your question about, you know, being an introvert and, and what I was trying to get out of pro wrestling, I thought it would just change my personality, it would change my life, it would change, it would answer that question. It was asking me, what are you going to do? And then I would throw them off because they don't know what to tell me when I say I'm going to be a pro wrestler. Like, I don't know what calls to send you to. I don't know what advice to give you. All right, you figure it out. And everyone started leaving me alone. And that was good because I'm introvert. And I don't want all these questions. So, um, so that's kind of, you know, like what I was hoping to get out of it. 
But again, life throws curveballs at you. you. What you plan to happen usually is not what happens, right? <laughs> Especially when you think that a thing is going to fix all your problems, because I know that story all too well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, one thing I want to comment on that you mentioned that I think is super powerful is this idea that fitness didn't feel like work. And I think that this is a misconception that people have all the time that um, I, I think there's a couple different buckets that this falls in. First of all, I don't want to turn my hobby into a job because I don't want to start to dislike it. Um, you know, if, if it's a job, I'm not going to want to do it anymore. I think that's number one. But then number two is if I turn my hobby into something that I love to do, then it's never going to be hard to do it. Right. Which I think is another misconception. So you said fitness didn't feel like work. Did that mean that you wanted to do it all the time and that you never had any struggles with staying motivated and staying focused and that everything just came natural and easy and it was butterflies and rainbows because it didn't feel like work or what were some of the challenges that you had, even though you loved your job? Yeah, I think the first mistake I made is I tried to do with all my clients what I did for myself. And that does, it, all coaches know this, that you have to make a custom plan for every client because every person has their own equipment they have access to and their own injuries and their own goals. What a guy wants to tone and what a lady wants to tone is two different things. And so I was having all my lady clients doing heavily upper body workouts that did zero glutes um, I was having them try to do exercises I did in my workouts, which they were not in a position to do. And I actually hurt clients. And I, you know, like I still have that pain that I carry with me to this day. Uh, I got caught up in what was on Instagram and what all the cool kids were doing. And so I just said, Oh, I'm going to do it with my clients tomorrow, even though I had zero experience coaching it and knowing what even the purpose of it was. Example, tire flip. Oh, everybody's flipping tires, flip tires is the new thing. I'll go buy a tire on Craigslist. I'll bring it to the gym. All my clients are flipping tires tomorrow. I never flip tires. How in the world could I coach my clients on how to do it when I never did it myself? And that mistake is like changed me to have that core value of lead from the front that I live by, that I would never ask someone else to do something I've never done myself first, you know? And so that's where that, that personal core value, but it's also a company core value comes from. Um, the other one was box jumps. Hey, those are the cool new thing. CrossFit does it. It's on Instagram. It gets jumps. your heart rate up. Let's just do box jumps. Uh, me too. And I never programmed <laughs> for my client. And, and it's probably because of this, right? A lot of the decisions we make are based off of pain. I had a client that jumped on the box. And when she jumped down, she rolled her ankle. She actually got put in a cast. And she's walking around on crunches for six months. And when you ask yourself, why did this happen to you? It's because I take full responsibility. Your coach programmed it for you. So that's why as coaches, I get really fired up and, and heated about exercise selection. Like, is the person physically the right fit for this exercise? Or are you doing it just to look cool or because other gyms are doing it? Or you're being lazy or just want to give the same workout to everybody. You don't want to customize it. That's not good coaching. That's being lazy. I did it out of sheer ignorance, but I learned quick when people were getting hurt in my gym because now you got cancellation. So, all right, now that hurts the revenue of the business. You got potentially bad reviews. Luckily, no one did it. They knew it was an innocent mistake that my heart was in the right place. But again, I just really demand high expectations for myself and I don't want people getting hurt on my watch. I want them getting better. I don't want them getting worse. So those were things that, you know, when you ask like business challenges, like those types of things. Um, and then I think what every business leader goes through is releasing control. Like eventually when you hire your first person and you're like, are they going to take as good care of everybody as I would? Are they going to have the attention to the details? What, are they going to say the things that I'll say it and I can train them till the cows come home. But like, there's always going to be a little bit of variation and variability. Um, because we're not all robots and copycats. And so it's about leadership and, and training and trust. And, and I'd say that's the other thing is that, you know, I probably, uh, the first few hires were not the best hires. It was because they had a heartbeat and a certification you're in. Um, now these days it's an extensive, extensive onboarding process. And now we get much better people on our team because of that. So, yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk about that for just a minute, because I know that there are some people who need to hear this, and I'm actually really excited that you brought this up. So for those entrepreneurs that are saying, I really love what I'm doing, 
it's a great break from, you know, maybe it's a side hustle. Maybe you're working on building a business, but you've hit your capacity of what you can do alone. And you're making that decision of, do I bring in help? How do I do this? Um, and they're worried about exactly what you just said. They're worried about quality control. What is maybe two tips that you have for somebody to help them maintain the quality standards that you have with your clients when you bring in that person that's going to have their own style and they're not a robot? Love it. So uh, exercise I do in my leadership team quarterly um, is a simple four quadrant piece of paper exercise. And so, you know, your standard four quadrants on a piece of paper and it's uh, love it, like it, dislike it and hate it. And so you just list everything you do and do you love it, like it, dislike it or hate it. And the first step is to get everything you hate off your plate ASAP. And, and so you want to delegate that because guess what? What you have in your hate quadrant as crazy as it sounds, it is in somebody else's love quadrant, right? So for me, I do not like anything related with like payroll and taxes and paying bills and like making sure everybody's getting paid. And, and so like that would be in my hate column, but our CPA, it's in her love column. She absolutely loves it. She wakes up and it brings her joy. So it's, it's about swapping those things out. I mentioned it, you know, earlier, like car stuff. Like I hate car uh, the oil changing and the brake pad and the guy when i go get it fixed he's like hey come around here i want to show you what i did with your water pump i don't care dude let me just pay you this is in my yeah. hate category so like you love it. this is your love category here's my money i'm happy to pay you but let me get out of here and and that's why i have a job and everybody has a job whatever you do that you love somebody else's somebody else hates and if you can make it as painless and as fun as possible you will have a lot of business sent your way. So that's the first thing is find what you hate in your business and get it off because that is draining your energy and your excitement for what you do. And you're probably procrastinating on it and you're probably doing a shortcut version of it while someone else will do it with like a very good attention to detail. So that, that would be my first tip. The and second really quickly, tip, oh, sorry, um, go ahead. no, 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 you're fine. I'm loving this because I'm hearing like life advice, not just business advice in this. And we'll get into that in just a minute. But you said it was love, like, hate. And what was the fourth one? Love, like, dislike, and hate. Got it. Okay, so, cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you were going to go into a second one. Yeah. So the second one is when you do hire help, don't hire just on skills. It's kind of ties into what I said before. They have to have the skills and they have to have the culture fit. All right. So like one of our core values is to create a positive culture. And so um, I hold my team to that. If they come and they gripe and they complain and I'll always say, cool, I'm hearing you. What's the solution? I might already have three, but I need to train them that every problem has two solutions. And so I stop them and I hold them to that. So if I hire a, a CPA, but she is super negative and she's pulling the team down every time someone talks to her, man, she's draining. She's always complaining about the weather and taxes and the government and this. She's got the skills but she doesn't fit our core values. So like, that's it. We have to hire and we have to reprimand and we have to fire around core values. So yes, make sure that, you know, what you put down as a task and you find the person with the skills, but ask yourself, how do you want them to behave? That is a core value is like, how do you behave around here? Because there is probably another gym or another business where you can behave the way you're behaving and it is accepted because it's their core, their culture but here it is not. And so that's the second is like, find the skills, find what you don't want to do, but then make sure it matches the behaviors that you want as well. And then you will find the all-star rock star team member you've been looking for. So yeah, that would be my advice. I love it. So I want to go back for a minute because I'm still mind blown with this four quadrants and I want to dig into this for just a minute. So love, like, dislike, and hate. Um, we were talking about this just before we had our coaching call. And I was talking about the things that I enjoy, the things that I don't enjoy, the workouts that I enjoy, the workouts that I don't enjoy. And, and we, we run into this thing as people 
where we believe that it has to be hard, that we have to do everything, that if we're physically capable of doing it, we have to do it, that if we're going to go to the gym and work out, it should be hard, that if we're going to be able to um, run a business, that we should do everything. And there's multiple places this has shown up in my life that's really screaming at me right now. And I, the first one is the first time that I hired a house cleaner. And I remember like house cleaning is on my hate. Like there's very few things that I dislike more than house cleaning. And so I hired somebody to come in and I had done it because I was at this entrepreneurial conference and he was like, okay, think of how much you pay yourself per hour. And now is it worth it for you to spend your time doing this thing? And that was the way I was able to get myself to the point where it was okay to let somebody else clean my house. But the first time I let them in, I was like, Amber, like you're a fully abled person. Like there are people out there who can't clean their house and you should clean your house. And it was like this wave of guilt. And then when you just describe it so easily like that, love, like, dislike, and hate, and don't do the things that you hate because it's somebody else's love. Like, it's like, give them the gift of doing this and take back your time and quit emotionally fighting. And I'm completely in love with this. So can you dig in a little bit more about other ways that you think people could incorporate this love, like, dislike, and hate quadrant into their life, their fitness, their business? Like, how can they just make sure that their life is the life they want using this quadrant? Yeah, I think it's those the, the, big, the big three. You know, we're always trying to improve health, wealth, and relationships. And so I think if you do those quadrants in all three, you're going to see massive change. So your health, do you hate the meal prep? Do you hate the workouts? Do you, you know, what do you hate? What do you love? Like, I love getting in nature. And, and I love walking my dog and like, so like, okay, so let's do more of the love and less of the hate. And, you know, then the things that you're kind of not, not as intensely emotional about would be on the like and dislike. Right. And, and kind of like even audit that, like, man, do I feel like I have swings of very extreme emotions? Cause I have only filled out my love and hate and my like and dislike are empty. It's like, okay, there's, there's a good learning lesson. So your health, um, you know, what, what do you like, n not like, what do you love? What do you hate relationships? Okay. Like, um, for, money's the biggest reason for, um, arguments and, and fights. So it's like, I hate talking about money. Okay. So how can we make this work? I've heard tips as, as far as like, you know, Hey, go out to eat, do it over dinner. And it's probably gonna be a less chance. It's going to be a fight because of the setting. But if it's just, you know, you're in your kitchen and then somebody opens up the bank account on the computer. Sure. It, it, it invites that almost. Also set up like goals and dreams, you know, like, so what should come out of this is by getting this hate off my plate, I can achieve a big goal or a dream. And so write that down and give yourself, you know, a, a, a carrot to chase that because when I spend more time doing what I love, I get this in 90 days, I get this in six months, I get this vacation, I get to buy this pair of jeans, I get to go get this massage, whatever you want to like dangle in front of yourself. And, and then, you know, the final one is the wealth is the business. So again, that's the easiest to apply this to what are you doing in your business? And, you know, the other thing that you can kind of relay this is, as well is, uh, you know, have your team do it. Don't, don't just keep this exercise to yourself. I do this with them for a quarter. And sometimes when they hear that they're surprised, there's things that I shared on my hate list. They're like, Oh my God, I totally thought you enjoy doing that. And so yeah. like, right. We make assumptions about people. And this gives you a, a way to express yourself if you're not good at it. Um, you know, guys, introverts, entrepreneurs, we can just kind of hold it all in. So by having exercises like this, but also systemize, because a lot of people will do this once and then forget about it. Put it on your calendar reoccurring quarterly. So it pops up and it says, do the, do the, the love, uh, like, dislike and hate exercise. And again, we even made it into a four quadrant um, sheet. So we just print it out, put on some like classic music, something that's more like thinking music that you're not gonna like sing along to. And everybody just fills it out and it, it doesn't take long, 10 or 15 minutes. So I'd say do the three big categories of your life that you know really lead to your, your happiness, your health, your wealth, and your relationships. And that's the best place to apply this. I love it. And I started laughing when you were talking about money and dinner, because that's the only way my CPA can get me to talk about my finances for my business is to take me out to dinner. So we do yeah. all of my book reviews, um, all of my um, financial book reviews over dinner, because that's yeah. it. That's the only way you're it's just, happening. So just, it made oh, me laugh. 
right? <laughs> yeah, and you're and you're distracted. I, I, distracted's the wrong word. You're you're combining it with something that you enjoy, so it doesn't feel like pulling teeth, you know. Yes. So yeah, I, right I, I absolutely love that. So okay, let's talk for just a minute about this zero confidence, because I think we're far enough into this episode now that people see how amazing you are and how confident you are and how, how much value you have to share with people. And this idea that there was a point in your life where you had zero confidence is just mind blowing. You talk about losing 60 pounds. You talk about that, giving you the confidence to train and to grow. Um, I think this is a common misperception that if I lose the weight, I'll gain the confidence. What actually happened throughout that weight loss journey for you that gave you that confidence? Because I'm, I'm sure it wasn't just losing the weight or else you just would have been in lack of, you would have been a thinner person that lacked confidence. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. And I, you know, like you brought it up earlier, like our, our, our childhood, our upbringing. So like when I was introduced often, it was like, Hey, here's, here's Dustin. You know, he, he, here's the, he's, he's shy. Here's, here's, here's my son. He's shy. And so like, when you hear that, almost like that verbal conditioning, you start to, Oh, that's me. I guess that's me. And then it was like, we go shopping and it's like, well, Hey, where's the Husky section? You know, like here's Dustin, my son, Dustin, he wears this Husky size jeans. And so it's like, okay, Dustin's shy, Dustin's Husky. Uh, you know? And so like, you start to like, accept this identity right and because you don't do a lot of self-talk as a kid or a teenager you don't like change that you just accept it as truth then it starts to form you know kind of who you are right and so i often like bring up with people you know we we all are, can probably be guilty of this is focusing on the wrong thing and it's like of all the good qualities why are we only starting with introducing with the wrong one right and so um the the lesson that i share here is like why red cars sports cars specifically get in more car accidents and it's not because people who buy red cars are reckless drivers and they speed and they're maniacs it's because they catch your eye and when people lose control of the car or something jumps up in front of them you turn to what's familiar and your brain the last thing is it remembers is that cool car so if you're oogling and you're like man nice car man i hopefully one day i get to buy one of those and then a kid jumps out a dog and you swerve you always go the direction of the red car you don't go towards the gray car that your brain just blocked out. And so that's the danger of focusing on the wrong things. If you focus on that, you just get more of that. And so that's why affirmations and talking about what you want in life are so powerful because it, uh, it absorbs that into you. It, it magnet, it brings it to you like a magnet. So like when you're just hearing, you know, explanations of yourself that are the wrong things, you step into that and you become that. So I think what fitness allowed me to do was like, I started looking in the mirror and saying more affirmation stuff. It's like, man, I'm, I'm looking pretty good. Like, man, like I got a nice pump, man, I'm losing weight. Like, man, I'm sexy. And like, I started talking to myself like this. And then eventually that's where that new version of me came. I wouldn't talk to females. I wouldn't talk to guys. Even I wouldn't talk to anybody. I would just hide inside because that's the identity I had. So fitness just changed that, that self-talk, which then changes your identity. And then once you start talking to people and like, there's just no going back, right? It's like the iOS. I can't go back to the, to the 2.0. I'm on 11 or 13 or whatever. So like, that's the same thing with you. When you upgrade, there is no going back, right? At least that's the mindset I have. So, so that's it. You just upgrade over time and you change your identity and the words you, you, you know, even I try to detach from that. Dustin was a, a person with no confidence. Dustin used to not have confidence. Dustin today has it, right? So that's it. It's just the words that you use to describe yourself. Yeah, I love that so much. And this ties so much into what I talk about as far as why Tough Mudder and physical fitness had such an amazing impact on my ability to eventually open my business and become the coach, speaker, soon to be author that I am today. And I think that it just comes down to exactly what you said. We convince ourselves through the things that we've heard that we are a certain type of person and we are not another type of person. And we learn through experiences that 
that description actually isn't right. The more we put ourselves in those new experiences, which I think is amazing. So um, I want to talk for just a minute about this amazing resource that you sent out um, to me. And I don't know if it's something that you sent to every one of your clients or whether you knew that I needed it. But when we started working together, you sent me a welcome packet that had atomic habits in it. And mm. this has been a game changer for me. It's so much of what I knew about the way that the mind works and had learned about behavior change was tied together in this simplistic format. How did you find Atomic Habits? What impact has that book had in your life? It, huge. That's probably one of my, on my top five favorite books of all time. And um, I read it probably a good five years ago. And since then, I've just been trying to get it into as many hands of people as possible. I'd say that and how to win friends and influence people are probably the top two books that I gift to people. Um, and, you know, they got to be open to it. They have to be willing to learn, you know, leaders are readers, as you see behind me. Um, and I'm almost like, the, the, there's that phrase that I heard and I almost embody that phrase, which is like poor people have big TVs and rich people have big libraries. Um, I got big both. So, um, but, but that's kind of what, how my lifestyle changed. Right. And so um, when, when the, per, you know, when they say, when the student's ready, the teacher will appear. So if somebody to me appears ready to learn this, the lessons in that book, I will gift it to them. So, you're, you know, to bring up what you said, I don't give it to everybody. Uh, I, ha I, 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 that's part of coaching is listening to what does this person need right now and then sending them the right book or the advice or the tip. And so, um, I'm glad that you enjoyed it. But one of my favorite things is that his goal in that book was to bring what we've learned through science about habits into the simplest way possible. There's a ton of fitness and weight loss examples, and there's always a to do at the end of like, I can do this to implement what you just taught. And that's my teaching style. So that's why it just jumped off the page to me. And I think that, again, if people want to find the MED, minimum effective dose to change their body and their health, it's really to hack their habits. You know, we're just a pile of habits. We wake up every day and we, we just kind of follow our habits. So instead of trying to find the next best thing or, or to just do something extreme, which is that's it tomorrow, it's nothing but protein shakes and salads and like crazy two hour workouts that the extreme never works. It's what do you do every day and make that, you know, uh, you know, a, a better version of what you did the day before. And you'll be a different version of you as time goes on, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I remember that from the way that we communicate because, you know, I think it was maybe two or three weeks ago, you were like, okay, what are your favorite foods? And I'm going through my favorite foods. And you started laughing and you're like, those aren't even bad. And I was like, then, then I can have them. Right. It's just a matter of, What's the portion size of those? What's the construction of your plate? What are you supplementing those with? How often are you having them? And I think that that's one of the, especially in the fitness world, is we have this perception that you are either a couch potato or you are a gym rat and there's no in between and you either eat fast food every day or you eat kale salads every day and there's yeah. no in between and, and you're really working hard to change that dynamic for people. And I love that. So as we start to wrap this up and move into the success segment, if you could give new entrepreneurs one piece of advice for how to really prioritize fitness while they are prioritizing their business, because I know that's where you've built your career, what would you say to them about how to make that happen? If you could bring it down into one tip. Yeah, uh, I would say it's find the path of least resistance because our default is to work harder, not smarter. And, uh, you know, basically we, we get schooled that lesson by the school of hard knocks in business is that it teaches you, you can't outwork the next person with hours, hours to hours. You're always going to lose. So it's, it's about like, where's the leverage? How can I make the most happen with the least amount of work? And for most people, it's simply nutrition. All right. Nutrition. The reason I get really passionate about it is it is the, the cause of weight gain and, and it's the cause of weight loss. The exercise, it just makes you feel good. It, it does shape your body with muscle. Um, there's the blood flow. It, it, is, it is beneficial in many ways. Um, there's, there's so many benefits to resistance training. But if we really had to get it down to just one thing to change, it is nutrition. We have heard those abs are made in the kitchen. Fat loss is 80% nutrition. 
it's all true. And so if people want to really like ask themselves, okay, now even in nutrition, okay, Dustin, that's a big word, break it down even simpler. It's protein and protein makes your body burn fat. And that's why every diet, if you get a 50 books all right by each other, all of them would say the same thing. You need to eat a higher protein diet. So it would be prioritize protein, focus on nutrition, add the workouts when the time is ready and be mindful of the uh, chasing of extreme answers. I think it's pretty apparent right now that veganism is very popular while at the same time, the carnivore diet, which is where you eat only meat is out at the, at the same time. And, and so like that just shows you how like polar opposite and extreme and the pendulum swings one way and then it overcompensates and it goes the other way. And like you said, it's balanced. What, you know, yes, you can have cheesecake. Yes, you can have tacos, but you said it how often, and then what are you doing to, to, you know, earn that in my mind? Like, you know, you just don't wake up and you can eat that. It's, I got to work out. I got to earn my carbs. I got to earn my sugary treats. I got to, I have to work for it. And then I have 80% of it needs to be vegetables and lean proteins and healthy foods so that at the end of the day, I can't have that scoop of ice cream. And on the weekends, I can't have that burger. And so like, that's where most people think, like you said, it's one or the other, either tons of junk food or just clean food. And so, yes, I do try to teach people that you can have both and be happier on your fitness journey and, and be sustainable along the way too. I love it. So for all of you who are listening, who have said, I really wanted to get in shape. I've really wanted to lose weight. I've really wanted to become healthier, but I'm just looking for that nutritionist that tells me that I can have ice cream. Here you go. Yes. You found him. Um, so I love it. Um, one more question before we, before we move into the success element, what was it about entrepreneurs? You know, I think that working remotely with entrepreneurs is such a niched down field of fitness. What drew you to that? What is it about entrepreneurs that you love working with so much? And why did that happen for you? Yeah, I think for 10 years, I helped my avatar was Mrs. Jones, which was like a middle aged lady that had kids got married, gained some weight. And I think after 10 years, I just wanted to challenge myself to go to a higher level of problems that you know, I kind of felt like I quote, unquote, like, figured it out. And I know that it's not a good place to be because you start feeling complacent and bored and not challenged. So I was like, man, well, I'm an entrepreneur and I know that entrepreneurs burn harder, stronger and longer than your average bear. And that's because they have so much more stress. They have leases. If they run a brick and mortar, they have bills, they have employees they have to provide for. And so I know that that requires uh, another level of coaching because they are burning uh, a lot more, uh, both candles at the end, or sorry, both ends of the can candle, they're burning more calories because of how active their mind is. And so to me, it was just taking it to the next level in terms of me being challenged and having a more interesting level of questions. Um, you know, and every entrepreneur is different because every business is different. So then it felt like, oh, cool, this is unique. Like every person I'm going to talk to, one person has an online business, the other person has 100 locations that are brick and mortar. And then another person has uh, something that they do out of their home. And so like, it was really cool to just kind of feel like I'm being challenged because each person has their own unique setup. So that's, that's really the answer is just like, I wanted to do that. And then as you see, I like talking business. So like after we're done talking fitness and nutrition, it's like, well, Hey, what are you doing for marketing? How are you getting leads? Like, how are sales going? What do you guys to do? What's your sales process? And then that was almost like the debrief after we got over the fitness talk and the fun talk. And so people started to say like, this is kind of cool. I get a little business and fitness when I talk with Dustin. So, yeah. I love it. I love it. All right. So I believe that we don't find success. I believe that we create it, that it's an intentional choice every single day to design a life that fits around the definition of success that we've created for ourselves. So when you define success on a, on a macro, you know, 50,000 foot level, what does that mean to you? I love that because I often say success is one of the most, uh, I guess overused and un, not a misunderstood word because it is different for everybody and people are quick to paint they're successful, but like, what if they don't think they are right? But you think they are because it fits your definition. The most obvious answer for a lot of people is financial success. Like when you have that, you're successful, but we know eight out of 10 lotto winners go broke. And it, so finances doesn't mean everything. My definition of success is to meet my uh, living expenses and then to have the freedom to do what I want when I want 
and to also have the ability to create for the world and to and to give to the world. And so, you know, like that's why I love where we live and our country. And, um, you know, there's people that would literally chop their right arm off to live in the United States. So for me, it's doing what you want, when you want, being able to create and being able to make a great living while doing it. That's my definition of success. I love it. One of the pit hole potholes that I found, I, I was I was trying to decide if I was going to say pitfalls or potholes, and it came out pit holes. So one of the pitfalls that I found is that people set this definition of success for themselves, and then, you know, we have such a short attention span as human beings that we don't immediately get it, and then we're like, man, I'm a failure. So I started adding this question in. Every single day when you go to bed at night, as you're working towards your mac your macro definition of success, how do you know if every single day has been a success to you? If I just helped one person, you know, like if I if there was just one person, I had a phone call, a conversation, um, a breakthrough, some mentoring, some coaching. I learned maybe I'm the person that got help that day. But if one person got better, the day was a success. My kids, if I if I kind of you know had a talk with them, that impacted them. But to me, that's the definition of a, if it was a good day. If I can lay down like today was a good day because I helped somebody. I absolutely love it. All right, so I want to do a quick random round. We're gonna start to um, let people get to know you just a little bit. Are you okay with that? Let's do it. I like it. All right, perfect. So, if you could do any profession other than what you're doing now, what do you think would be fun to attempt? Man, that is tough. Uh, I think, as weird as it sounds, I would like to work at Disney. Um, really? I really? Yes, I really like their culture. And if I could have a leadership position there, who knows? Maybe I would be there. But yeah. I love it. I actually have a really good friend of mine that um, worked for Disney for 11 years and she loved it. So that's yeah. interesting. Um, we talked about books. You mentioned how to win friends and influence people. You mentioned one of my favorites, which is Atomic Habits. Um, are those the books that you've recommended the most to people, or is there another book you would recommend to new entrepreneurs? For new entrepreneurs, I would, it, it depends on their goals. Again, do they want to scale? If they do, E-Myth uh, is going to be your go-to. It talks a lot about like scaling. Um, but the other one, when it comes to like, I would just say blanket statement for all entrepreneurs is definitely going to be um, uh, Relentless and then Winning, you know, Tim Grover's new books. Like they're just they're both so good. So they're both so good. I just finished listening to winning on my drive to Idaho and it was amazing. And I loved relentless. So I love And this. I'm a leadership guy. So I'm going to throw in five levels of leadership, John Maxwell too. So love yeah. it. So when you're personally reading books, are you like me where you need to like smell pages and highlight and turn, or do you like audiobooks? I am. I, so here's where it's different. If it's somebody's story, like an autobiography, like I listen to Arnold Schwarzenegger's, I didn't read it because it's somebody talking and I want to hear them tell their story because I really like hearing their voice. But if it's like tactical strategies, how to make, how to think better, how to operate better, how to lead better. I, I am a highlighter for sure. And I even told my son, I'm going to pass all these books to you and you don't even got to read the whole thing. You just got to read the highlights. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, if you could time travel, where would you go and why? I love the eighties. So I would go back to the eighties and I don't know where I would go, but I'd probably go to a big wrestling show like WrestleMania three um, and when Hulk Hogan slammed Andre the Giant and just 80,000 people are going nuts, um, I think that's where I would go. So, oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> and it's so interesting to think of going back to a different part of our life, but doing it with all the knowledge, skills, and experience that we have now. So I love that yeah. answer. All right. We have talked about a ton of ways to be successful on this podcast. We've talked about a ton of growth things. We also always need our downtime. What's the last TV show you binged that you absolutely loved? Uh, that I loved was actually, I think, man, I, I, I rewatched it cause I loved it so much. And that was Cobra Kai. Me and my, like, it's probably not even appropriate for my son. There was a good amount of cursing, <laughs> but we just had a blast. There's a lot of eighties music, a lot of eighties references. Karate Kid is one of my favorite movies because it's a coaching movie. And so when they made that, I was like over the moon and then it delivered. Like there's so many like spinoffs that don't deliver. It delivered and I loved it. So, yeah. That's awesome. And then my personal favorite question, because I'm a music nerd, 
What's your pump up song? What do you listen to when you need oh, to not? Oh yes, uh, man, there's so many, but I am a <laughs> rocker at heart, so it's gonna probably be ACDC. Um, something like Back in Black, Shoot the Thrill, something like that to get me ready for the gym. Yep. I love it. Justin, thank you so much for coming on the show with me. I really appreciate it. And for those of us that for those listeners who are not looking at the screen right now and seeing all of your stuff scroll across the bottom, what is the best way for people to connect with you if they want to continue this conversation? Yes. So I'm on Instagram at Dustin.bogle. And then I'm on Facebook, Dustin Bogle. Look for the handsome bald guy, and that's me. Love it. And if you're listening to this and you want to be able to ask questions, to be involved, to watch the interviews live, head over to Facebook, join the Success Center community and come connect with me there. I'm looking forward to having the opportunity to connect with you. Justin, thank you so much for coming on the show. You've been amazing. Thank you. It was awesome, Amber. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the More Than Corporate Podcast. If anything that was said during this episode resonated with you or provided value in any way, it would mean the world to me if you would head over to iTunes and leave a rating and review for the More Than Corporate Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. I'm really looking forward to connecting with you. If you'd also like to connect, I've created a Facebook group that is full of amazing people who also make it their mission to live their best life every single day. If that's that sounds like something that you're interested in. The name of that Facebook group is Success Center. Head over there, request to join, and I look forward to connecting with you soon.